horror had its emergence from folk tales, gothic literature, short stories, usually told by the grandmas of this world, who stored that vital piece of culture inside them and spread it by narrating those spooky stories to keep hold of the extremely small attention span that kids usually have. Or at least, that's what it did for me. No matter how much of an energetic kid I was, whenever there was a session which involved sharing those type of stories, I was the first one to join, sitting around that cozy fireplace to hear those wonderful and sometimes terrifying stories, which were usually told just so kids like me behaved in a, you know, humanly way. Like eat your veggies or sleep early, otherwise insert some regional ghoul that would scare the living shit out of any child. And all those legends gave birth to stories that were featured in movies, particularly in the horror genre, as it perfectly captured that feeling of macabre which those type of stories usually features. The scare from those tales lasted for some decades, and as time went by, people were just simply not getting faced by it, which demanded for a longer and more complex plots rather than a 60 to 80 minutes linear structured storylines. Basically the type of movies that we get nowadays. But there was a different format of storytelling in the past which compiled various short stories in one film, usually featuring three or more short stories which were connected through the means of sharing similar themes between them or being featured in the same universe which advances the main plot in hand. Overall, both of them are a great tool that makes the bigger picture more visible and understandable for the audience. Anthologies And the reason I said it was something from the past was because films that were directed in this format never got the mainstream attention, which some of them clearly deserved. And another reason being that those type of movies were available in abundance or were a bit more prominent in terms of producing good movies in the past as the better half of anthological films released around the time when horror movies in general were really popular. Like the 70s and 80s, the movies that we get nowadays aren't that good. There are some exceptions which do well in the box office and boast a sensible storyline, but in general, most of them don't catch a great deal of attention of the public or are just simply dog set. But even those good ones can't outshine the appeal of the older films, which somehow feel more professionally made, even though they were released like half a decade ago. I am not going to salivate over the past titles, or waste my time by making fun of the newer ones, as there is a film which lies in the sweet center spot of that timeline, and most probably is the best anthological film that I've ever seen. Three Extremes, an Asian film which came out in 2004 that features three short stories made by the following directors. Fruit Chan, who is known for writing and directing Made in Hong Kong. Park Chan Wook, who co-wrote and directed Old Boy and numerous other great thrillers. And Takashi Miike, who directed Audition, which featured in my favorite horror films of all times list in the honorable section. Those three names are like the Asian galore of horror slash thriller, being among the best directors that the Asian continent has ever produced, residing in three different countries, which usually delivers the best films out of all the others. Fruit Chan being from China, Park Chan Wook residing in South Korea, and Takashi Miike was born in Japan. It was basically the best collab that every horror slash thriller nerd was dying for and they weren't disappointed in any way or manner, with the three of them sticking to their preferred way of filmmaking and how they deal with certain topics, which when mixed with the concept of anthology, led to this wonderful crossover of different cultures, driven by a particular theme, which is the main talking point of this video, which I will talk in depth after brief summaries of the said stories. The first story in this anthology starts with Mrs. Lee, an actress who was popular in her early years for some TV roles, who goes to this almost secluded place to buy dumplings from a person who calls herself Aunt May. She greets Mrs. Lee by saying how good looking she is, 
and compliments on her past acting skills. But Mrs. Lee stops her by saying that she has quit acting, most probably because she thinks that she is not beautiful anymore. Which is why she has come to Aunt May, who is known for treating aging through the means of eating her dumplings, which she makes by adding a secret ingredient that Aunt May uses on herself too, which then makes her look way younger than someone might perceive, making her the best advertisement for her work as she proclaims that the dumplings that she makes are worth the price. And then she starts to give a monologue about the history of dumplings, describing her own process of making them and the various ways of cooking it. Basically, it's the equivalent of Baba Shrimp. You ever been on a real shrimp boat? Aunt May serves the dumplings to Mrs. Lee and every noise in here feels like it's oversaturated but in a good way it makes the whole experience feel eerie. The eating noises and the close-up scenes elevating that feeling of uncomfortableness, a mechanism which is used throughout this part of the movie. The scene then cuts to Mrs. Lee's husband who is cheating on her with a younger woman Another probable reason as to why she is so desperate to look younger. It's no brainer that things aren't going well between them as they feel distant from the way they converse with each other. And how there are so many red flags of an unhappy marriage as the husband gives the most generic excuse to cheat on her. We see Aunt May in a hospital where she smuggles something in a small package from a nurse who works there. Yeah, the secret formula to her dumplings is almost revealed right here. And if that wasn't clear enough, she pretty much describes that in the next scene. Mrs. Lee reveals another reason as to why she is doing whatever in the fucking hell she is doing because she hasn't been able to bear any child of her own as she is infertile and asks Aunt May to give her the most potent stuff which can help with that too. And right after that scene, we see Mr. Lee cheating which is witnessed by Mrs. Lee. So she knows about it but for some reason still wants to conceive a child with that person. We cut to Aunt May who as a side hustle performs impromptu abortion to people who legally cannot get that. Like underage girls with unplanned pregnancy without any paperwork. And this scene is almost unbearable to watch with all those heightened sounds. So I'm just gonna move on to the next scene. Mrs. Lee arrives there to eat Aunt May's most potent dumpling and goes to check on her while she is cooking it but scares the living shit out of her after saying, you know, something that I cannot sew or want to talk about. Only to come back right after that scene to fully examine it, sewing the limits that she is willing to go to look and feel younger as she eats the dumpling made from that stuff right after witnessing what it was. But it does work. She starts to feel better about herself instantly which even her husband notices by smelling her as by the looks of it they have somehow found a new love for each other but nothing of that caliber comes without a price as the young girl who aborted her child dies due to blood loss and trauma caused from all the pain because believe it or not Aunt May is an aunt and not a doctor. But hey Mrs. Lee is getting all the compliments from her sallow rich friends as they too notice that there is something different about her until she gets a rash in her neck which starts to leave a fizzy smell and when she calls Aunt May to ask her why that is happening she is informed that the pregnancy was a result of incest. Yeah, the plot just gets weirder and weirder by the moment. And it doesn't stop there because when she goes to the doctor's clinic the report comes back to her being two months pregnant Yep, pretty wacky stuff. The mother of the young girl kills her family, which attracts the police in that area. And with all that attention, Aunt May tries to make a run for it, leaving Mrs. Lee with no option to continue with her treatment. 
which then cuts to her performing an abortion on herself, most probably to continue making more dumplings, as she has grown a taste for human blood, an addiction that she has to rely on, becoming a fetus vampire of some sort, a theme which is continued in the next story. The scene starts with a person drinking blood from another person's neck. While she is having that drinking party, her phone rings, where she complains about how the food gave her a stomach ache, so she leaves it to eat in the morning. But it turns out that it was just a scene from a movie, which ends with the director saying, Cut! Wait a minute, that's the title of this film. While the director is having a conversation with one of his colleagues, it is made pretty clear that he is a workaholic who will go to great lengths for the betterment of his movie. It's not only that, from all the interaction he has with other people, he comes off as a nice and well-respected individual who is even willing to give a ride to one of his co-workers. Well, he's not a saint, as even with all those admirable qualities, he still prefers making thriller movies with a fascination on psycho killers. While heading home, his wife calls him and the conversation between them is reminiscent of the plot of his movie from having leftovers for breakfast to the biggest one being that the set looks similar to their house. When he arrives at his home, everything seemed normal until the electricity cuts out of nowhere, which was fine. But then someone drinks his veggie smoothie. Yeah, I know, absolute monster. But the director is big brain, so he uses a lighter for illumination, which the intruder uses against him by spraying some sort of flammable spray. The scene cuts to the director being tied to a corner, while his wife is in a web of threads with her fingers glued to a piano. He tries his best to de-escalate the situation by politely asking the intruder to take all the valuables and leave them alone. But he soon realizes that this is not his house, but the set where he was directing his movie, while the intruder talks about how he shouldn't beg in that manner right from the get-go, as he is supposed to be the head of the house. It was pretty much clear that the intruder wasn't there for money, as he isn't afraid to show his face and knows a great deal about the director and his occupation, mentioning a scene from one of his movies in great detail. The director asks him who he is, and in response, he does some sort of audition, in the hopes that the director somehow remembers one of them, which leads to some hilarious scenes. But that tone shifts pretty quickly. When the intruder realizes that none of his acts was ringing any bells in the director's head, he goes to his wife and passes her finger. The director tries to go after him, but it's revealed that he is tied to some sort of contraption. So he just consoles his wife by saying that he will somehow handle the situation, while the intruder mocks him. He soon realizes who the intruder is an extra who played some roles in his past movies, a deranged Stan of some sort who admires the director's work ethic and who he is as a person and gets angry when the director fails to recognize him from his past roles after treating him nicely when on set. Huh, reminds me of a trope of another abnormal group of people. He envies his entire lifestyle, how he has a big house, is good looking, being married to a beautiful woman, but most importantly, the person that he is, a genuinely good individual. So he asks the director if he has sinned, which he denies. So the extra gives him an option. His wife can go free, but he has to kill someone in that room, which he agrees without much hesitation. Until he realizes that the person he's supposed to kill is a child who was in the room from the beginning. When asked who the kid is, the intruder replies with this. And after every five minutes, he will, one by one, cut his wife's finger, only stopping when the director strangles the girl. While the director is contemplating about his options, the extra gives his backstory, 
and how that has shaped him as the person that he is now. Growing up poor with an absent drunk father who used to beat his family. That mixed with bad grades and not having attractive looks has made him the same person that his dad was. Continuing that dreadful cycle. Polar opposite to the director who had a nice upbringing and achieved everything that the extra desperately wanted. Five minutes passes by and he keeps his promise, chopping off one of the fingers, which puts more pressure on the director as he asks his wife if he should strangle the kid, which she clearly denies. So he tries to reason with the extra about how he had to overcome numerous hurdles to reach where he is now, which is stopped mid-sentence by the extra as he tells him to stop quoting a line from his own film. <laughs> The director tries to strangle the kid but couldn't come to the terms to doing it as he is a good guy. Or is he? Confessing how he badmouths a rival director whenever any actor asks about him. But the extra doesn't approve of his weak confession. And as an example, he shares one of his own how he has already strangled his wife before coming to his house and left his son to die there. And with all of that, five minutes passes away and another finger goes flying. So the director confesses again, saying that he has been having an affair with one of his co-worker for months. This news breakout didn't bode well with his wife, so he consoles her while insulting her at the same time. How she has never worked for anything and leads a superficial lifestyle full of dumb stuff like clothes and cosmetics. You know, woman sit. Who doesn't do any household chores and can't play the piano for set. But the extra reveals that the director isn't the only one who is having an affair. His wife has been cheating with him for quite a lot of time. But the director knew about that way before the extra disclosed that information. Another unhappy relationship. The extra tells the director to make him laugh and in return, he would extend the deadline. And this is where we see the director losing his temper for the first time, insulting how the extra chooses to live his life. A huge shift in tone from the one we saw in the beginning, as he too has some sort of ego, calling the intruder a lowlife extra and demands to be untied, assuring him that he will not talk about anything that happened even going to the lengths to say that he can chop his wife's entire hand to save time. Well, none of that works. And out of pure desperation, the director does this, which is just wild stuff. But that doesn't amuse the extra and he cuts off another finger and grinds them to bits and pieces in a grinder, knowing all too well that they could have got them reattached. And with all of that, the director gets the determination of killing the child as the extra talks about how he isn't doing this out of hatred, taking her wife as an example, who hates him more than the person who chopped her fingers as he screams to kill that child. In all this madness, another five minutes goes by and the extra chops off another finger and all of that finally cracks the director as he starts to strangle the kid only to stop when he realizes that it's the extra son and him not being dead makes the extra even more angry as he threatens to chop the entire hand while the director tries his best to go after him only to be pulled back by the contraption which is tied to the entire set. So he just goes back to strangle the kid but fails with no avail and in that moment the extra slips on a wedding ring, falling onto the web of sharp wires where the director's wife takes a huge bite of his neck, throwing up blood in the process, another similarity with the movie that her husband was making. Moments before the extra dies, he says this. Which goes along with why they were tied in the set. He was the master now, controlling the strings, making them play by his rules, as he made the director's life turn into a thriller movie. 
The scene ends with the kid saying that he will take revenge. His father is dead, but he was successful in creating another monster who will keep that cycle running, ruining the perfect life that the director had. As all that trauma makes him lose his touch with reality as he confuses his wife with the kid, strangling her, thinking if he does that, he will save his wife, killing her in the same process the extra did to his wife while he is tied to the only place he can call home, his film set, alone with his loved one laying dead and everything that he cherished gone in one dreadful night. A theme of loneliness which is carried with the next story. It all starts with a dream sequence where a woman by the name of Kyoko is trapped inside a plastic bag which in itself is inside a box while a man is shoveling dirt back in a hole to bury that. The said woman wakes up from that recurring nightmare which usually ends in that exact moment. The scene cuts to Kyoko coming back to her apartment and notices a man waiting outside her doorstep and this is where the loneliness aspect that I was talking about comes to play. The whole building somehow feels stranded with the cold weather amplifying that feeling. Even the conversation between them doesn't seem natural as at one point Kyoko says this She comes off as an anxious and sensitive type of person who isn't that good at keeping up with conversations. We soon learn the occupation of Kyoko. She's a writer and the man in question is someone from the publication department who is there to collect her next novel and to give her a gift as a token for how well they are doing. While the man was leaving the building, he notices a young girl standing behind a door who disappears from that small room when he turns his head away, only to reappear walking up the stairs. In the next scene, we see Kyoko opening an old box, taking out a fancy looking dart just to look at it for a moment and then opens the gift given by her publisher which turns out to be a music box which plays out while we see the young girl standing near a lift. She is the sister of the writer, Soko, and most probably is the reason for her nightmares as we catch a glimpse of a box and Soko saying that she is burning, which Kyoko tries to deny. The scene cuts to a nightmarish flashback of some sort with young Kyoko and Soko in a mangled position nearby two small boxes and a man with a mask standing behind them. By the looks of it, it is some sort of play led by Soko and Kyoko who are doing some flexible stuff while the man opens up the boxes signaling the girls to go inside it which they somehow completely fit in as the man locks it up and takes out some darts similar to the one that Kyoko had and throws them onto the small boxes which then opens up with flowers inside them, with the girls nowhere inside. Even though both of their performances were indistinguishable, the man for some reason before Soko, rewarding her a necklace. I know, you know what might have happened, but let's continue anyway. Soko getting a reward didn't bode well with Kyoko, as he looks almost distraught from what she just witnessed. But Soko assures her, saying that she will be rewarded too. So Kyoko starts to practice while everyone is sleeping. Okay, now it is not disclosed what sort of relationship the man has with these two girls, but no matter what that is, it doesn't make this next scene any better, as we see him sleeping alongside Soko. Yup, just move on to the next scene. The flashback ends there, as we see the writer wearing the same makeup and attire as the man while standing as a mannequin. The publisher recognizes her as Kyoko tries to give some vague reasons for why she was doing that, which the publisher replies with why can't he be that person, which Kyoko agrees, saying that he does look like him. The resemblance is uncanny, the only difference being that unlike that person, the publisher is there for her, but Kyoko being Kyoko leaves that conversation hanging. Along the way, she gets another flashback with the circus tent burning. 
which cuts to her dancing inside that moments before it burns down and we finally witness for ourselves as to what might have happened to Soko. She gets inside that small box for rehearsing only to be closed inside that by Kyoko who then locks it up saying she just wants to be her for a night, sleep like her and have nice dreams like her. The man comes back to help out Soko while Kyoko tries to stop him from doing that by stabbing him with a dart and in that moment Kyoko accidentally knocks down a gasoline can burning the box in the process. The man tries his best to open the box as we see Kyoko running from that burning tent which is transitioned to the present time with the writer running in an almost endless snowy place stopping in the same location where her dream starts which is cut to a scene where the man does some really weird things to a doll which has some sort of voodoo effect on the writer as she gets covered in a plastic bag as the man puts her inside a box and starts to dig a hole to bury it in which ends in the same way as the recurring nightmare that Kyoko has as we see her wake up in the same bed while she looks at something beside her. Another similarity being that the scene cuts there and jumps to her coming back to her apartment. The only difference being that this time there is a bouquet of flowers with an invitation to some place which she goes by taking an empty bus which is moving in a dead and cold looking place nailing that feeling of emptiness and loneliness that we see Kyoko deal with throughout the movie. The address takes her to the circus she used to perform in when she was young and inside that tent lays a burnt box. Kyoko walks up to that box asking for forgiveness proclaiming that she didn't do it out of hatred or for the necklace as she loved her more than anything or anyone. She hears a knock coming from the box as the whole tent starts to shake and a shriveled voice asking for help. So she opens the box and after witnessing the contents inside it, her face fills up with a terrified look as she crawls away from the box, stopping only when she catches a glance of the circus master as he tears away his mask, revealing the scar that Kyoko gave him. And then he says this. <laughs> To him, both of them were the same and he loved them equally. Yep, really weird guy. He makes her watch as the box opens up and we finally get to see what was inside that box. What's in the box? A bloody face of Soko pops out. The envy of Kyoko is the reason why Soko is dead. And she knows that it could have been easily avoided and feels genuinely sorry for what she did. So the man gives her a necklace similar to the one her sister had and you can clearly see that all Kyoko ever wanted was love and affection. She is just a lonely soul which the man uses against her covering her inside a plastic bag as her nightmare turns into reality. While suffocating her the man says that you can't have one without the other, a perfect pair of some sort as to him both of them are the same two people but one soul. The scene is followed by him covering dirt over the box and for the first time we witness the latter half of that nightmare which is continued as we finally get to see who she was looking at beside her bed. It was her sister Soko. They have always been together as they talk about sharing a similar nightmare just from a different perspective. That's not the only thing this year as the scene ends with this. Yeah, all that stuff before this was another dream slash nightmare that they were having which is hinted way before this but that doesn't ruin the theory I had for this video. Well, after those not so brief summaries, I can finally discuss about the theme that all of them shared. Even though all those characters had different goals, each and every one of them were driven by a single emotion, envy, raised from societal values. But they weren't the only ones to blame. All of them had someone 
as a means which made them do what they did. They weren't born bad and aren't particularly horrendous people, just blinded by one of the most powerful emotions, making their decision somewhat reasonable. That doesn't mean I am defending them in any way though. Mrs. Lee isn't a good person under any circumstances. Neither is Aunt May. All they care about is trivial things like how they look, her husband being the boast, who tries to hurt his adultery by giving her money just to lead that facade of a relationship rather than getting a divorce because that wouldn't bode well with their sallow friend circle and, dare I say, society. Doing all that for the same friends who talk behind her back and envy her newfound beauty, which she did to continue her lustful relationship with her asshole husband, who only loves her because of her looks. She never wanted a child, as she fucking ate it, nor she cared about getting back into acting. All she did was become numb to those horrible acts that she committed with Aunt May, as both of them ruined numerous lives just because Mrs. Lee envied the lifestyle that comes with being beautiful. Blinded by that emotion as they went beyond every imaginable extent to achieve it. While the extra, on the other hand, devoted a good chunk of his life envying the director, doing research about his downcomings rather than focusing on himself and his family. He loves to talk about orthodox family values but fails to fulfill any of them, even going to the lengths to using his own son in his sick crusades. His narrow-minded outlook towards success not only ruined his and the director's life, but everyone around them, who had to suffer just because envy blinded the extra into thinking that ruining another person's life would somehow help his miserable existence. But he didn't do all of that out of hatred. The director's wealth and success wasn't what bothered him, neither did he envy something sallow like his physical attributes. But how, even with all that privilege, he still acts like a nice person, unlike other rich people, who are generally assholes. But he was successful into corrupting the director's life, which ended up with him losing everything, making him on par with the extra who killed his own wife. He completed his sole objective, to put a stain on the director's perfect life. Now on to the last one, which was following the same theme up until it was revealed that it was all a dream, which in its defense was hinted heavily from the beginning. But the dream slash nightmares that she had were ruled by the feeling of envy, as dreaming about suffocating means that the person is suffering from inner guilt and self-doubt as she was running away from her past, aka Soko being her conjoined twin, who was interfering her in real life, particularly in the romantic department. And the box can be a little metaphor of Kyoko trying to hide Soko, which she doesn't want to do as she loves her more than anything. But she was having thoughts disguised as dreams in which she accidentally killed her, who was standing between her and the person she loved. But after realizing what she did and as the feeling of envy fades away, she deeply regrets her actions, which would have been great as that is the sort of repercussions we have seen throughout the last two short films, but the dream concept kinda ruins it, as there is nothing at stake. But in the end of the day, it was Kyoko's envy for love and attention that her sister was getting made her almost commit something that could have been fatal for both of them, because as we all know, we can't have one without the other. Three different directors. Three different stories, three different people, blinded by a single emotion, deep rooting from societal issues, ruining lives of numerous innocent people. And what can be more real and truly terrifying than the emotions that has the power to control people and make them commit unimaginable atrocities? Not to be confused with love or hatred, as envy is way more powerful than that. The true horror among all these wannabes who try to reach the level of fear that feelings can have over people.